be network. It might be network. It might be it might be delay or in traffic whatsoever. The Lord will take away all the distraction. The Lord will help our heart and and lead us by his mercy into his presence again, even this evening in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Can we plead with the Lord concerning the person he's going to be using for? Can we pray that the Lord will fill him up? You know, the Lord will fill him so that he can, he can dispense what the Lord has filling to us even tonight in Jesus' mighty name. Can we pray the Lord will help him give him unction even for this class this evening in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Lord. Let's begin to round up our prayer. Let's begin to appreciate the Lord because he will meet with each and every one of us. Thank you, everlasting Father. Father, we are grateful for drawing us to yourself again. Thank you for this meeting. We declare it open in the name of the Father in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. We ask that you come and take preeminence and come and take control of this meeting tonight in Jesus' mighty name. We pray you mobilize every heart, you draw every soul to yourself today in Jesus' mighty name. We will not just come, but we will co we'll come and experience, oh Lord, something definite, something peculiar to us in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Lord. Thank you, everlasting Father. Have your way. Let your spirit breathe upon us. Let your spirit breathe upon us, Lord, this evening in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Lord. Our experience, King of glory, will not be able to recover from it in Jesus' mighty name. Oh, Father, Lord, we thank you. We appreciate you. Thank you, everlasting Father, for in Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Um, okay. Praise the Lord. Uh, good evening, everyone. We are all welcome to this evening's uh, discipleship class. Uh, we'll take our hymn now as we ask the Lord to um, help us again to higher grounds. Our prayer tonight is that he will take us uh, onto higher grounds in the name of Jesus. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I onward bound, my prayer, my aim is high. Yeah, ground. Lord, lift me up now. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's stable land. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher, yeah, ground. Two. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears this me though some may dwell where these are bound my prayer my aim is high yeah, higher ground. Lord, lift me up. Lord, lift me up. And let me stand. Oh, by faith on heaven, stable land. I higher plain than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on a ground. Three. 
I want to live above the wall, do Satan's death at me a hold for faith has called the joyful sound is the song of saints on a ground lord lift me up lord lift me up please and let me stand by faith on heaven stable land a higher plane than i have found lord plant my feet on a yeah, yeah, ground for I want to scale the utmost height and catch a glimpse of glory bright but still i'll pray till heaven i found lord lift me on to higher ground lord lift me up lord lift me Oh, and let me stand by faith on heaven, stable land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, please plant my feet on higher ground. Can you just make that your prayer again? I said, Lord, my heart has no desire to stay. Where doubts arise and where fears dismay, those some may dwell there and they are okay. Where this about, Lord, my own prayer today, Lord, and my aim is that you will take me to a higher ground. Take me to that ground, Lord, that plane, that higher plane that I have found. Take me, Lord, to that ground higher than where I am. Let me have a deeper encounter with you. Let the Lord so pretend over this meeting. Let Jesus alone be glorified. Let him have his way in our midst. Be thou exalted, O Lord. Come and take your place, O Lord. Please come and take your place is tonight I in this class come and take your place in this place come and take come take your place Lord, come and take your place. Come and help us again today. Speak to us clearly that everyone will find his own portion and your name alone will be glorified. Blessed be your name. Let Jesus alone be seen, be heard, be known, be understood and glorified this in our midst today. Have your way, Lord. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. 
Uh, again, we welcome everyone who has joined us today. The Lord bless you. Uh, let me find out from those who were here last class to say, uh, what was it that you took home uh, from the class? Uh, what was it that um, you took from the class? What was your take home uh, from the study we had uh, last time? So that um, those who were not here uh, could um, pick and join us in all that um, we, the Lord brought to us uh, last class. So, yes, the floor is open. Uh, let's take imputes now. Or maybe you left the class and for you, um, there were things you were meditating and you needed clarity. And maybe we ended uh, without space for questions. Yes, yeah, so you want to ask a question. You want to throw in light on what you understood last class, or you want to just give us your own take, uh, general take uh, from all that we did last class. So yes, now I'm waiting for you now to speak to us. So those of us who are in class, this is our own section to regurgitate and um, help every one of us to be carried along. So I'll wait for you to either raise your hand the Zoom way or you just unmute and then give us your take. Yes. Who will be sharing with us today? Yes. Uh, you know I will not uh, move away from here, so I'm waiting for you. So that I will know whether we need to repeat last week's class or we should go forward. Yes, Sister Febo, go ahead. Good evening, Bryce. Uh, good evening. Yes, um, last week, um, I was, since, though I was actually learning well through the lesson, but up to the point when our sister, sister Wearimu brought her contribution, I was so broken. When she talked about how she snapped at her pastor, despite her very quiet nature. You know, when she first described her nature, she said, anyone that knows her knows that she cannot even uh, reply or respond in a situation. She would rather just walk away. And if she's been known like this since she was young, it means that even that outward appearance of nature could not assure the peace inside. It couldn't, it could not be replaced for a new birth experience. It couldn't, um, it couldn't do the magic or the work. There was still something lying inside that even she was not aware of. On the day of staring up or provocation, that thing should face. In fact, before the meeting ended, I was already praying and immediately after the meeting ended, I was just begging God to cut short right now, deal with anything at all in my life that I didn't even know is there. You know, except you have not, we have not been well tempted. Sometimes when a strong temptation comes, you know, the, the, when the Holy Spirit was buttressing this point to me, he spoke about provoking one another to love. He said, provocation is not the problem. Provocation is more like a staring. So when there's a staring, the thing is that nothing is added to you from outside. Though. It is what is inside that will come out. So if there's a staring, a provocation, what they are asking me is just to show what I have inside. And you see, another scripture that God used to portray that thing for me was the raising the degree of fire, of the heat. Maybe if that thing was at first degree, I could stand it. Second degree heat, I could stand it. Maybe when, just like the king said in the, in the case of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he said they should increase the heat. So if they increase this heat or this fire to seven degree, maybe there is something hiding, hiding inside somewhere that at first degree provocation, he will not show. And I'll think all is well until that provocation comes from a serious source. 
maybe the, the embarrassment, the whatever is deep enough to stare down, deep down, not just surface crashing and I'll think I'm okay. Maybe this provocation will be so deep that when the be my belly is turned, uh -huh, we know whether the depth contains Christ or whether it's on the surface. Then the another thing the Holy Spirit used to buttress it for me was an apple. You know, when you buy certain fruit, it looks good. Maybe an apple, you just take the first surface bite. Oh, it tastes good. Until your teeth dip in, you, you sink your teeth deep into the fruit. If there's a decay inside, when you take a deeper bite, it will show. The decay will come out. And the men will never stop biting. They will not stop digging into us. So that's our sister's uh, contribution the way she described her quiet nature from childhood, and suddenly she could pick up her bag and say, this is it, I'm done. She walks away. Where did that kind of strength come from? If, if, if her nature from birth was enough, then what now happened? So, so there is, there is a, a, a need for this transformation. There is a need for something that is beyond my my nature. I could be saying I'm a very easy person, very easy going on until something that is beyond that nature will show face. So I have really been begging God to, to evacuate, crush that thing. That's that thing that is lying there quietly. If there's anything at all, I don't want you to wait for the day of snapping. It was a challenge to me last week that I could mm -hmm. be, be placed in a situation where uh, uh, such light of the Lord will come and impurities will show. May God help me now so that it won't it, it won't get to that level. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Sir for that. Uh, for each one of us, we must keep begging God uh, that when those provocations come, uh, just note that that's the only reason. Uh, they were not there to pull you down. Uh, the provocations are there to help you identify the areas where we must uh, bring to the altar. And uh, when God shows you, don't be discouraged. Uh, it is that God is still working. Uh, so, you know, like she said, it is from degree to degree. Uh, 10 degrees is getting warm. 50 degrees is getting hot. When it gets to 100 degrees, it's boiling. So God must take us, uh, and God will not allow us to be uh, to get to that level where you, you will scatter. Uh, he said he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. Uh, so there are some things you will never know uh, until you have matured. And that's why we're talking about the maturity. Uh, it is when that child begins to mature, that you will know whether his voice will break or not, that you will know whether he will be hairy or not. So he needs to mature. Um, sometimes you see some children when they are born very fair, uh, but as they mature, they become very dark. Uh, so you need to allow, uh, as we grow in maturity, God allows more provocations uh, to test us at that level where we are. Thank you very much. Yes. Any other person would like to bring a reflection or a question or a thought from last uh, class? Yes, anyone present or uh, who listening to the recordings can speak to us. Yes, let's get one or two more before we proceed. Yes. Okay, everybody's shy. <laughs> oh, we're looking for who will speak first. Sister Febo has opened the floor, Hello. so. Okay, go ahead. Ade Bukola, yes, go ahead. Sir. Good yeah. evening, sir. Good evening, go ahead. Man. Um. Well, I saw last week was, a form of recap. You went through our study, reminding us that um, discipleship 
is continuous and cumulative and that we should not allow any gap because when we allow a gap, we shall have to go back to teaching to see what has been taught and that it is a, the purpose of God. Uh, the central purpose of God is to pour us into himself until we become fully like him, that he will now manifest himself. He wants us to be conscious of the fact that this teaching is continuous and it is for our good. It should be from the heart and not the head knowledge. Um, the way I saw it that was that for us to go to be fully integrated into Christ Jesus, we have to imbibe what we are being taught and to live it out so that we shall now become exactly like the role model that Jesus is meant to be for us. Uh, I, 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 that is uh, what I took away last week that I meet most uh, my knowledge of uh, discipleship must be systematic and it must be cumulative mm -hmm. and that it must be in me, in me. Although the example was very good, but I thought that it is what I am being taught is that I should grow in Christ and become more like him and that I can only do this through discipleship systematically and continuously. Praise God. Hallelujah. And that yes, it is not a, a head knowledge. I, yeah. I am to be transformed into mm. that mold that I'm being poured into. Take the form of Jesus Christ as my moral model and be completely transformed. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Ma, for that um, take. Uh, and truly, that was the recap. Uh, we, we had to go through because um, many of us who were in the previous class uh, were not there. So we needed to uh, go through that class again, uh, just to remind ourselves of, of that, that discipleship uh, is systematic and is cumulative. Uh, it's cu systematic and cumulative and that the Lord must uh, give us that help uh, in reproducing. Uh, we're looking that it must be a systematic and a cumulative uh, learning, uh, which we must come up with. Uh, so we, we were looking last week that it must not be head knowledge. It's not knowledge. Head knowledge. Uh, it must be, uh, so, uh, we didn't want something that was head knowledge. It must be life. Uh, it must be something that produces life. Uh, we said it is systematic and cumulative. Uh, you know, it's to be conformed, to be transformed into the image uh, and the full personality of the master. Uh, we were noting again that discipleship is God's means of achieving his eternal purpose and central goal of calling any man to himself, which is to be conformed to his image of his son, the savior, Jesus Christ, in order that Christ might be the firstborn among many brethren. Uh, without this conformity to his image, we noted that such that we become of the same stock, quality, nature, personality with him, he will be ashamed uh, to or shrink to call us brethren. Uh, we noted that discipleship is the only means designed by God to bring us into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, growing up into him in all things. Uh, praise the Lord. Okay, so uh, today we'll just take a, a bit of um, more definitions on discipleship, that discipleship is God's family training scheme. Uh, so discipleship, we have seen that it is um, God's uh, family training scheme. We have noted again that it's a process of reproducing 
or impacting the life of a teacher to a people. We've noted that it is, uh, it is God's means of achieving his eternal purpose, uh, which is the central goal of uh, making us to be become like Christ, to be conformed to the image of Christ. Uh, today, we want to look at the fact that it is God's family training scheme. Uh, let's look at that Galatians chapter 4, uh, verses 1 and 2. And then somebody else will read for us Hebrews chapter 12, 7 to 11. Uh, Galatians chapter 4, 1 and 2, Hebrews 12, 7 uh, to 7. Uh, to 11. So if you find any of them, uh, you can read for us. Yes, go ahead. Galatians chapter 4, verse yes. 1 and 2. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Now, uh, if I read it from the good news, that uh, Galatians 4, from the good news, it says that, but, uh, but, now, uh, but now to continue, the son who will receive his father's property is treated just like a slave while he is young, even though he really owns everything. While he is young, there are men who take care of him and manage his affairs until the time set by his father. There is a time like we have noted, uh, set by his father. So discipleship is that family training scheme where uh, that young believer is trained, is, is, is tutored, is trained, uh, you know, in the family scheme. And that's why we say that uh, discipleship is not Bible study. Discipleship is not class. Discipleship is uh, falling, uh, allowing my life in the hands of tutors, in the hands of governors, uh, that God has chosen to mold me uh, to remove, you know, they say that uh, foolishness is in the, you know, lies in a child. It is that rod of correction that removes it. Uh, so there might be, there must be hands for whom God is using to remove uh, my dross, my sluggishness, and things like that. Uh, the Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. Okay, uh, we can take now. Um, We'll take the second scriptures, Hebrews chapter 12, 7 to, uh, 7 to 11. If you have it, you can read for us. Hebrews chapter 12, from verse 7. Mm. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not son. Furthermore, we have had the father of our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reference. Shall we not neither rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits and live? For the very for death verily for a few days, chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partaker of his holiness. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Hmm. You know, uh, the good news says, endure what you suffer as being a father's punishment. Endure what you suffer as being a father's punishment. Your suffering shows that God is treating you as his children. Was there ever a child who was not punished by his father? If you are not punished as, um, as all his children are, it means you are not real, you are not uh, real children, but bastards. 
In the case of our human fathers, they punish us and we respected them. How much more then should we submit to our spiritual father and live? Our human fathers punish us for a short time as it seems right to them. But God does it for our own good so that we might share his holiness. When we are punished, it seems to us at that time something to make us sad, not glad. Later, however, those who have been disciplined by such punishment reap the peaceful reward of a righteous life. So we are noting again that uh, discipleship is that that constrains us. Is God's method of constraining us, of putting boundaries over our lives so that our lives will become all that God had wanted us to be. You know, there are things unbelievers do and they get away with it. But when a Christian tries it, oh, it looks like heaven comes crashing on you. It's because you are a child. It's because you are a head. God cannot afford to allow you to misbehave. It's like you see, sometimes you see the way uh, boy, children at under bridge, would you like under bridge? They, you know, when you see children that grow under bridge, they wake up when they want to wake up, eat what they want to eat, we eat, sleep what they want to sleep, watch what they want to watch, go where they want to go. They are not accountable to anyone. Now, imagine that your son, who, um, you know, uh, has been under the house, has been under the comfort of the family, now decides to say, but that boy in under Ojolegba Bridge is uh, 15 and I'm 17. Why can't I go where I want to go? Why can't I do what I want to do? Why can't I have the liberty? And the father said, no, because you are my son. You must be disciplined. You, I must know where you are going. You must come back to this house at 8 o'clock. You can't do what you want to do. You can only do what I'm asking you to do. You might not know why now, but later on you will find why. So every time we are going through spiritual discipline, we, have, we could take an attitude that, oh, I'm suffering. Or I can take an attitude that God is removing the dross in my life. So what is your attitude to suffering actually determines your growth in Christianity. Those who say, me, I know, go suffer. And every time they find a small uh, pain, they want to change location. They want to change. They, they can't stick to a bit of discomfort. Anytime something discomforts them a bit, Oh, they are looking for the easiest way out. Such a person will never grow in his discipleship. When you say to him, brother, you can't do that. He said, why? Why can't I do that? I will leave the church and I will go to where I can do what I want to do. Oh, you can't do this. He said, no, if you want to let me do that, then I will go. I don't like people impeding on my freedom. If you don't like people impeding on your freedom, Honestly, you will not grow well in discipleship because discipleship is a family scheme. You, your growth in discipleship must be in the confines of a family because it is only because you are a member of that family that you can also be a heir of that family. If you are not willing to receive the discipline of the family, then you are not ready to receive the, 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 the inheritance of the family. Only those who are willing to go through the discipline are qualified to receive the inheritance. And God disciplines us in many ways. Sometimes you are praying about something and it doesn't happen. You know, sometimes I don't know whether you experienced it. When you just give your life to Christ, it looks like as you just pray, before you even finish praying, ah, heaven has answered. But now that you are older in Christ, now that you seem to know more Bible, you seem to pray, 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 and it looks like, oh, these results are not coming. 
when you were a baby, just like a baby, when a baby cries, yeah, the mother does not ask him what's wrong. She runs there. But when a child has grown and now he's 15 and he starts crying, the mother sits where she is and says, Shagun, what's wrong with you? Why are you crying? Then let him talk. Or come here, come here and tell me what is wrong with you. But when he is uh, six months, the mother doesn't say, come here. The mother doesn't ask him question and say, eh, Shagun, what's wrong with you? No, she goes there to check. And even without knowing why he's crying, even when she notices that his cry is just frivolous, she still pets him. Why? He's still a baby. But you see, as he grows, the mother needs to begin to spank him at a certain point to remove that childishness, to remove that stupidity, to remove that selfishness from him so that he can grow to be a proper son who no longer is a taker but a giver. A son that can be sent, a son that can endure hardship, a son that can be told to fast, can be told to wait, can be told to do things. But for a baby, you don't tell him to fast. When he's ready to eat, whether the mother likes it or not, at that time he wants to eat, food must be made available for him. But at a certain time, the mother says, wait, eh? go and sit down first. Food is not ready. When food is ready, I'll call you. Eh, that's training. The child can say, but that's wickedness. Don't you know that I'm going to be hungry? Why didn't you make the food available? That's an irresponsible child. That's a child that is not likely to grow well. But as you train those children, you are training them to be disciplined. You are training them to wait. You are training them to know that all conditions will not always be the same, that you need to learn to be patient when things don't go your way. Praise the Lord. Yes, so uh, just to note that for a heir uh, who is a child to be brought into the inheritance, he is kept under training and tutelage till he grows to walk into the uh, heritage of his father. It involves discipline and training of character. The tutors and governors of the kingdom are men and women appointed by our father God to watch over our growth and development until we become like the son whom he loved. This is discipleship. Not to partake of this family training is to grow wild and become a bastard and even a vagabond. So we are noting that uh, there are people God has kept over your life. The first question I want to ask again this uh, evening, do you have someone over your life who can tell you stop? Do you have anyone who has an oversight over your life, a parental oversight over you spiritually over you that can say to you, stop? That when you are so angry and say, I'm going to do X, Y, Z, and say, no, you will not do such a thing. Do you have someone over your life that has that right to say, stop? If you don't, then honestly, you cannot grow in discipleship. Because discipleship is not teaching. Discipleship is not just Bible study. Discipleship is a family training scheme where there are tutors, there are governors, where that they say to you, you know, sometimes you have some students uh, that they don't like biology. If you leave them, they will read biology from morning till night, Monday to Friday. But you have a teacher that says, no, put it away, we have finished the biology period. Now it's time for mathematics. He said, my teacher, I don't like mathematics. I don't like mathematics. I want to read my biology. If you allow him to read only biology, then he will not know English. Then he will not know mathematics. So you have a teacher that says, no, you've done enough of biology. Stop. Oh, yeah, open your mathematics book because this is compulsory for you. Open your English textbook and let's do English. Let's do some comprehension so that you know how to write letters. You know, so you need, you need governors, you need teachers who help us to be in check, who help to streamline us, to guide us 
and so that we don't stray away. We don't stray into the bush. We don't slack behind. And they say, hey, catch up, catch up, catch up. Because you know, you are going to finish four, four topics in this time. And you are just in the first topic and you are, you are taking it your time as if, uh, as if that's the only thing we are doing this time. So buckle up, buckle up, buckle up. That's because the teacher can see that you have four topics in a term. Why are you spending all your life in one topic? You will not do well. So some of us, we just want to be left alone to do what we want to do, when we want to do it, how we want to do it, the way we want to do it. And that's why our Christian lives have not grown. That's why we seem to be lagging behind. You've been in Christ for five, six, seven, eight years, but there's no difference between you and a new convert because you like to have your way whenever you like to have your way. Nobody can say stop and you will stop. Because if you don't do what you like, uh, you will just, nobody can tell you anything. When you live that kind of a life, God, can, your life will not be useful to God. So can I challenge us? Do you have anyone who has an oversight, spiritual oversight over your life? Is there someone over your life that can say, hey, don't go there. Don't take that job. Stop that. And you will say yes, yes, sir. Is there someone who you report who your life is accountable to? Someone who can say, so how are you doing? How is your devotional life? Because you see, absolute power corrupts absolutely. When you don't have anyone who watches over your life, the honest truth is that you will likely waste your potentials. May the Lord help us again to yield ourselves to governors and tutors, human beings that God has prepared to mold us into becoming what he really wants us to be at a time like this. Praise the Lord. Okay, uh, before we go into the second segment, which is discipleship can be likened to a master apprentice uh, or a teacher pupil relationship. Let me find out if anyone has a comment or a question before we uh, progress. Any comment, any question from what uh, we had looked upon so far? Yes, question, comment? Or is it clear to that point? Yes. Yeah, go ahead, ma'am. Yes, go ahead, ma'am. I wonder if you can, Yes, explain to us how then does a person choose a disciple? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so the process of choosing the disciple is like the process of knowing your spouse. So number one, uh, you begin to pray about it and say, Lord, uh, that particular person you have uh, uh, given over my life, there is someone you have appointed there's someone you have appointed to watch over my life. There is someone you have, you have kept out there for me. Lead me to that person. Lead me to that person. That's the first prayer. And as you are praying about that, you now are beginning to become uh, conscious. Uh, so as you are now beginning to find a uh, visible uh, lives, uh, audiovisual lives, a men and women uh, who God brings your way, whom you can see Christ progressively growing in them, whom you can see uh, the grace of God breaking forth in them, uh, and who you are beginning to see uh, that I would like to yield myself unto this hand uh, for my making, for my molding. Uh, then you begin to observe that life maybe at a closer range. You begin to come close. Sometimes it could even be someone uh, that, um, uh, you know, the person might not even know you are, you are watching him. You are coming close to him, just like uh, uh, you are trying to know whether is this the husband I should marry or not. And you are just watching him, uh, you know, looking at him from afar. And then suddenly you, 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 you come to that knowing that guy. There is, I see Christ in this life. Progressively, I see Christ in this life. 
And um, I think I would like to submit onto this slide. And then you now go to officially uh, submit the person, and then you declare to him. Uh, most uh, uh, importantly, you also uh, should note that whoever I want to submit my own life to, I must be able to see that he himself or she herself is already in a discipleship relationship because actually they can't give me what they don't have. Uh, it is as they are being helped with the comfort they have received. It is that comfort they can use to help me. So I am observing that this person uh, I want to uh, yield my life to uh, understands discipleship, understands the uh, demands of discipleship, and he himself or herself is currently in a discipleship relationship where you can see a progressive following. Then I can now yield myself, go and officially submit myself. Usually they will um, uh, get involved with you and then that family uh, begins. And now that's the starting. Uh, but you see, even again, uh, it is you that must sustain that relationship by constantly keeping him abreast. A discipler does not want to be uh, standing in your way. Uh, he doesn't want to obscure Christ from your view. So he doesn't necessarily stand in your front and not allowing you to see anything but him. No, he is not your savior. Christ is your savior. So a, a proper disciple, a discipler allows you to see Christ. But you see, when you, he knows that when you look at Christ, you are likely to get confused because it looks like a complicated textbook. But when you look at the life of a discipler, you now see Christ broken down into simpler bits that you can absorb. You can, um, you can um, uh, come across and then you discover that um, we then uh, uh, can progress in and that relationship. So the disciple must continue to put pressure on the disciple. We saw that with Elijah, uh, Elisha and Elijah. It was not Elijah that was looking for Elisha. No, it was Elisha that was running all over Elijah because uh, he needed the grace of God that was already in the life of Elijah. So it was him, Elisha, that needed to keep running. The other sons of the prophet were content with nothing. They were just content to say, yes, we are Elijah's, Elijah's uh, disciples, and that, that satisfies us. No, Elisha was not fully satisfied. He wanted the grace of God made manifest and sincerely, he got it. So yes, it's like a marital relationship where you first begin by prayer, then you look and observe, and then you prayerfully submit uh, to the discipler who will in turn uh, have, take you as his child or you know, with any arrangements you have with him and then be able to build your life into what Christ will expect it to be. Praise God. I don't know if I have um, attempted uh, to respond to that. Um, Thank you, sir. Yeah, okay. So any other question or comment before we make progress? Any other uh, comment? If not, uh, then I will then make a bit of progress and then go to check the fact that discipleship can be likened to a master apprentice a master apprentice, or what you call a teacher pupil relationship uh, with a predetermined curriculum and behavioral objective between the Christian and the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a personal apprenticeship under the master Jesus with a view of becoming like him. So we are noting that uh, discipleship is a master apprentice or a teacher pupil uh, relationship where uh, they, you have a teacher and you have a student. You have someone who is receiving and one who is giving. That kind of relationship uh, where there's not a relationship between two masters, 
No, it's a, between a master and an apprentice. It's not a relationship between two teachers. It's between the teacher and the pupil. Uh, so God must help us to continue to come to that point where we are uh, in a relationship, uh, you know, um, and we are trusting God to bring us uh, that change uh, that will be required. So it's not a casual relationship. I know that, you know, for those who do uh, freedom, you know, you must buy things for your master. You don't just do freedom and say, I'm doing freedom last time. No, you do, do freedom, you cook for the yoga, you bring drinks for the yoga, so that all those things will provoke prayer, you know, in the life of uh, the yoga to pray for you and release you into your own uh, destiny. So, yes, uh, God must bring us to that understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so let's take a few scriptures just to buttress that. Luke chapter 6, verse 40. Luke chapter 6, verse 40. Uh, Matthew 4, 19 to 20. Luke 6, 40. Luke 6, 40. Matthew 4, 19 to 20. Uh, there may be somebody else who just read for us. Matthew 11, 29, and 30. If you find any of them, you can read for us. Luke chapter 6, verse 40. It says, the disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. So the disciple is not above his master. But when he becomes perfect, he will be like his master. Okay. So the, disciple, the master himself, if he's growing well, is not under threat that, oh, my disciple will overtake me. No. If the master is growing consistently, even in the Lord, then the disciple can never overtake him. So we, yes, we are noting that uh, as long as the disciple, if he does well, he will eventually be like his master. Praise the Lord. Okay, uh, let's start the second one. Matthew 4, 19 to 20. Matthew 4, 19 to 20. Yes. Who was it? Jesus called out. I'm reading from um, Living Bible Translation. Okay. Jesus called out. Come along with me, and I will show you how to fish for the souls of men. And they left their nets at once and went with him. So you see that prompt obedience. They left their net at once. Immediately. Come with me, and I will teach you to catch people. At once they left their nets and went with him. Uh, the question before us today, do you have that um, grace? Do you have the desire to leave everything and follow him? Can you leave everything and follow him? That's the kind of request. That's the kind of uh, thing we're talking about. Do you have the grace to, to say, you know, I leave everything, I'll follow him. Praise God. Any question? Any comment? If not, we take Matthew 11, 29, and 30. Matthew 11, 29, and 30. Who is reading for us? Matthew 11. Lord. Yeah. Matthew 11. Yeah. 29, 30. Matthew 11, 29, and 30. I'll take from New Living Translation. Okay. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle and you will find rest for your souls. Then verse 30. For my yoke fits perfectly and the body that I give you is light. Take my yoke and put it on you uh, and learn from me because I'm gentle and humble in spirit, and you will find rest 
For the yoke I will give you is easy, not complicated. And the load I will put on you is light. Uh, may the Lord give us that understanding uh, in the name of Jesus, that his burden for us is light. Uh, he doesn't give us uh, things that will sink us. No, rather he gives us things that will build us. He gives us issues that will build our lives. Okay, uh, let me stop again to find out. Any question, any comment? Yes? Nobody? No question, no comments? Yes, David, are you planning to speak? Okay, he's not. Yeah, so anybody with a question or a comment at this point? A Good disciple? Evening, yes, go ahead. All right. For me, I don't know. It is the scarcity of um, disciples that is, I don't know, that is a burden. For me, for example, I've always wanted to have somebody, a Christian who is also a school owner, uh, someone uh, that could, you know, I could learn from because I know that um, the world calls it mentoring, but I know in, in, in the kingdom, it, it is discipleship because whoever you submit yourself to, you know, is someone that himself is, like you have rightly said, is being discipled, we can see the grace of God. And it's so difficult because in the, you don't know how people are running what they are running, the conviction they have and all that. So for me, I've been looking for, honestly, I have not found. <laughs> and I'm just still trusting in God. I'm still it's trusting. Okay. So it is this shortage, this shortage, I don't know. And I think even maybe I might be speaking the mind of so many people um, on the platform too. Yeah. Mm. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that. Yes, so um, my answer will be two. One is that um, that's why we are going through this training, trusting God that um, God will train, uh, we raise more and more uh, disciples who become disciples. First, you are a disciple, and then you become a disciple. Uh, then uh, I will say again that that's a challenge. For those of us who have been in discipleship for many years, uh, the challenge has been thrown to us. Can others see Christ in me so vivid that, um, like she said, they want to learn. They want to do what is right. But can I come to your school? Can you open up to me how you manage your finance? Can you open up to me how you manage your staff? How I see Christ in your managing staff, in your, uh, and that you are not a disciple in class and a, a, a tiger in the office, but that indeed you, are a, you carry Christ wherever you go. Now, she's saying that uh, she actually wants disciple, a disciple, and she wants someone who is actually in her field. Uh, so she says she has not seen. Uh, so if God is preparing you, and you are saying, too, oh, but God has begun to help me, uh, then yes, uh, we can talk to, you can reach out to Sister Okwe and says, uh, follow me, uh, follow me. You know, that's what Elijah did to Elisha follow me uh, and you will not get lost uh, because I myself, uh, I, have a, I have an understanding of the master, follow me. Now, let me put a, a, a let me put a, um, uh, a caveat here. The discipler is not perfect. The discipler is a disciple who is ahead in following Christ. It's not as though the disciple himself has attained. So Paul says, 
I, I run the race, not like one who has attained. No, I am still running the race. However, Paul could say to Timothy, imitate me as I imitate Christ. I am in the process of imitating Christ. I desire to imitate Christ. I'm pressing on to imitate Christ. Timothy, follow me. So when you, it's like saying that you have a, a, a teacher, a graduate, for example, someone who is a graduate uh, in biology, and you employ him to your school to teach your secondary school students biology. He is a biology teacher in your school. He is a master student in Unilag. So he's a student in Unilag, but a teacher in your school. Now that's how, a, that's how discipleship is. So the discipler uh, is under a discipler. Uh, the, the, your discipler uh, usually has, is a disciple under another discipler. But because he is following well, you also will follow well. So, uh, you know, um, it says the things you have, you have seen of us, commit to faithful men, who will also commit to other men. Uh, that's Timothy, uh, uh, second Timothy chapter two, uh, verse 22. You say you have seen us, the things you have seen us, you have touched us, you have, you have beheld us. And you know, that was what the disciples said. That was what John, when John was giving his testimony about Jesus, he said, we beheld him, we touched him, we saw him, we know him. We are, this, is not, this is not theory. We saw him go to Gethsemane. We know him, we slept with him, we saw him go to the toilet. We knew him, you know? And they, you know, we saw we, they were so much with him that in Acts of the Apostles, when the Pharisees uh, uh, wanted to stop them from preaching, and they said, no, uh, we can't stop this thing. And they, they, the Pharisees consulted among themselves and said, Kai, yes, we can say they had been with Jesus. That's the only thing that makes these barbarians, uh, this, this, this sound. They were with Jesus. And we know that a man like John Mark was also a disciple of Brother Peter. Uh, so you see that uh, John Mark uh, was almost like a, a, a boy for Peter. So as Peter was following Jesus, John Mark was, uh, John, uh, uh, Mark, sorry, was following, uh, uh, was following Peter. We saw Timothy and Titus who were following, uh, who were following uh, 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 um, who are following Paul. And Paul himself was submitting himself even to the disciples and the elders, even in Jerusalem. So that's how discipleship is built. It is a chain. It's a chain. So, um, yes, we are not saying, oh, uh, this person you have gotten can never make mistakes. No. Uh, he might do something that uh, he himself is still growing. However, when you look at his life, you know that this one has set his face on Christ. He has set his face on becoming like Christ. Uh, he will get there. He will become a master and he will grow in perfection. At the rate he's going, he will soon have his PhD in, in biology and become a professor, professing biology. He is on the track, follow him. Okay, so I, I leave us with that challenge and trust God that uh, those of us, and that's why for many of us whose growth has been sluggish, God is saying no. Quicken your growth because there are many people waiting for you. There are many people waiting uh, to follow you. But once you are doing rising and falling, rise and fall, rise and fall, you, you, they, they can't see anything to follow. And then they just say, no, 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 there's nothing here, just nothing. All this discipleship is fake, it's fake. No, it's not fake. Uh, if you find genuine disciples, you will know that that's the best thing that has ever happened to your life. It makes your journey very easy. 
you know, rather than it's like uh, rather than going to derive the almighty formula, you know, rather than go to start and uh, go to the dy dx to try to derive the equation, just take the equation and apply. Uh, so what a discipler does is just uh, apply, put in the figures and the result comes out. It's a much easier way than going to have to reinvent the wheel uh, all over again to, to have learned what uh, the disciple will have just said, don't go there. Uh, I've seen, I've, I, I went there uh, four years ago and I hit my head terribly, you know? So for example, you have, um, you are such a, a, a proprietor that you're alive and alone. You are alone, you are five and six. You can you just say, I can't understand how somebody does business without taking loan. No, 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 it's not possible. Not in Nigeria of today, not possible. Then you submit your life under a discipler and he says, no, no loans. And you know, it becomes very crazy. How do you expect us to live? You ask many, many, many questions. He answers many, many questions. Then you say, okay, I will submit. I will submit to this disciple. Doesn't make sense to me, but I will submit. And then first year went back, your business did not go under. It survived. Second year, it survived. And then you say, eh? -huh. So we can live without taking loans? Wow. How did you get there? A disciple sat over your head and said, this loan you will not take. He said, sir, but we are broke. He said, no problem. Look up to God. Don't look up to the banks. And that's where you, you begin to find help. And he said to you, yes, we have lived like this before. And we, our, we got our hands burnt. But when we began to live like this, we saw the grace of God. The same God who has helped us, that same God will help you. And he is not a respecter of persons. What he does for one, he will do for all. Praise the Lord. Okay. Yes. So let me also find out any other question. Yes, Sister Febo. Okay. I just want to share on the issue of a disciple, discipler, mm. that um, from my own understanding and how far God has helped me, I wouldn't know, but this is what I really want to share. Your discipler may not necessarily be a school owner as you are a school owner. If God gives you a school owner disciple, the very best, like Bra Guile will say, you dissolve into your own solvent. At least whatever where you put your shoe is where where is pinching you is where is pinching that person. It's very easy to learn that one, so practical. But you know there are other aspects of our lives apart from school business. You know, you you have a marriage, and God knows what is going on in that marriage. You have children, and God knows the kind of heady or stubborn children you are dealing with. You have other aspects of your life, and God in his infinite mercy might choose a disciple for you that will touch other aspects of your life as well. So I'm, I'm trying to say that it mustn't be a school owner to a school owner, a plumber for a plumber, a driver for a driver. If God leads you to a disciple, the important thing is that in that person, you can see Christ. Then you must be open to share aspects of your life with that person. Now, there is a help you will get from another school owner, not necessarily from your disciple who is not a school owner. Even though God will be giving him wisdom to speak into it, but for practical sake, there may be issues he may not see very well. Now, in that case, you'll be trusting God not just for another disciple who is a school owner, but God may lead you to teach us and instruct us, you know, a school owner who may not necessarily be your disciple. But in this person, you have seen that, okay, God has helped this life to some extent. That person might just be a teacher or an instructor to you. And you have another authority who is your main disciple you are reporting to. And I want to say that one of the things that helps is not just to stay on your own and be praying for a disciple as if it's going to drop from the sky. When we go for 
meetings. These are the ways I have found help. When we go for meetings in those days and I look around and I see people, I think that mm, the way this person is talking or walking or behaving, I think I want more than this meeting. I can reach out on my own. And uh, please, I want to see you. I want to talk to you. In the process of talking to two, three people, you will see that one in whose voice you can hear your voice, in whose voice you can hear your pain. You will see that one whose um, guidance looks like, ah, it's like God knows exactly what I want. He's telling this person exactly what to tell me. So one, I want to say that your discipler may not be a school owner like you. And if it is, best for you. But because you have other aspects of your life, God may give you, my own disciple is not a school owner, for instance, he's a lecturer. And God is using him for so many aspects of my life, especially my marriage, as I'm observing his wife, I'm being helped, you know. But along the line, I am seeing friends, senior friends, instructors, teachers who are school owners, just like other people who I also don't know who their disciples are, but they also talk to me, for instance, on school issues and we discuss. So I'm just trying to say that whoever is praying for disciples should not say, if he's not a school owner, I won't open up. It might be someone else that in whose life your help resides. And other mm -hmm. school owners you meet might not be your disciples. They may just be vessels for God to use to instruct you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you very much. So yes, everything she said, very perfect uh, and very um, apt and very instructive. So uh, so if you join everything together, I'm sure that everyone uh, on this platform today should be able to uh, come up with his, I mean, um, um, you know, deliberately carve a disciple. Uh, very, very necessary. Discipleship um, is good. Discipleship class like this is good, but this is still class. Uh, discipleship, discipler relationship makes the class practical. That's your practical. You know, so this is uh, like the lectures, uh, but lectures without practicals is like a, a medical student who attends lectures regularly, but he doesn't go for clinicals. And you know that he will be a murderer. <laughs> he will soon he will murder people. He needs to go for practicals. He needs to go for clinicals so that he sees how the theory is, uh, you know, domiciled or is domesticated in the practical, you know, the practicability of all that has been said to him in the uh, in the theory class. So yes, I agree with you. Everything she said, very, very, very uh, germane. You can, uh, you don't necessarily need to have a school owner discipler. Um, uh, you can have one, you might not have, uh, but uh, if you have, it's a plus. And then we are praying that more school owners who are disciples, who are disciples will grow and make sure that their lives grow. Uh, and that's why when you are growing your school, you must, be, um, you must be diligent to note that whatever I am doing here, I want it to be a sample. So you are not just running your school. You are running a school for Christ, that Christ can use it as a template. Christ can use it as an example. Christ can use it and say, hey, look at him, follow him. And several people are saying, oh, I don't know how to do this. I want to live a godly life. I want to run a school for Jesus, but I just don't know how. And then Christ is saying, go and understudy this person. But so in, in running your school, you must be intentional. Yes, that's the word I'm looking for. You must be intentional that this is a sample. What I am running here is a sample for younger uh, upcoming school owners to come and pick up. Just like the disciples, we looked at their lives, their lives have become samples to us. 
let run your school in such a way that it becomes a sample that you can tell anyone who wants to be a Christian and run a school to say, hey, come over, come and see, come and see. May the Lord give us that grace to get to a point where we can point to school owners and say, I see you struggling, come and see. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Yes, uh, Mrs. Aduko, you can go ahead. Um, good evening, everyone. Yeah. I just want to give a, an example of how discipleship has helped me. My own discipler too is not a school owner. Um, but I remember an incident that happened many, many years ago when I had first entered discipleship. That time I was very heady, very stubborn, and I thought I knew everything. And so, um, you know, I went to my disciples' house. And when, when I got there, I took, a, I took some roasted chicken. And as I got there, she told another younger disciple to share the chicken for everybody present. So I'm thinking, ah, I take a, a, piece, a big chicken to you. And it's already roasted. That you are going to take, put in the freezer, keep some for your husband and keep. She said, no, everybody should share. Initially, I thought, ah, wow, now for these people. Look. And then the younger disciple was sharing. She gave herself and her own son the biggest piece and then gave everybody small, small, chin chinny pieces. I was fuming inside. What kind of rubbish is this? But I kept quiet. I was just watching. She didn't even bat an eye. She didn't even seem to see it. And she just went on her, on her normal business. At the end of the day, this disciple that shared the chicken did not leave any from, for her husband, for my disciple's husband. She said, ah, me, I think say, oh God, don't go church or something like that. So she didn't leave anything. For, she just said, no problem. <laughs> then, then, she, then something else that really touched me happened. She was making semo for everybody. Now, normally I don't eat semo. But the way I was trained, when you go to somebody's house, whatever they offer you, you manage it, you eat it. So I said, okay, Samo, let's eat. And then this woman just came, this other disciple that was sharing the kitchen, just came into the kitchen and said, ah, Samo, the man will bring me, no go feed Samo. It's in day too soft. Ah, 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 what's in with this? I was livid. Ah, ah. I told myself that if it's in my house, that, that person will not eat at all. That I said, I'm making Samo. You are saying the person that you brought cannot eat this sermon. Do you know what my disciple did? He said, ah, ah, no problem. I know what to do. She entered the store, went and brought Gary, and made one very strong, very hard Gary for the, for the person. On that day, the Lord told me, that's a human being like you. Because as far as I was concerned, if it was in my house, that person would, I would have told that the lady off. And then she won't have eaten anything in my house, talk less the person she brought. But on that day, I saw a practical example of who Jesus Christ truly is. And that changed my orientation forever. So I'm just telling everybody that, look, we are reading these scriptures and it's good. And we're understanding it and it's meaning, making sense to us. And that's perfect. But the truth of the matter is that even in teaching, we know that it's what you see that sticks the most. When you see it, you touch it, you feel it. That's what sticks most. The modern methods of teaching are all about seeing and touching and feeling. That's what we understand the most. And that's why even Jesus Christ brought his own disciples close so that they can see him, they can touch him, they can feel him, they can go, wow. That's what held them in the hard times. Praise the Lord. Mm. Praise the Lord. Thank you very much. So really, sincerely, that's how it goes. Uh, so without that um, practical side of it, uh, for many people, they are in discipleship for 20 years, 10 years, so long. But you, 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 you know, like she said, she could have been attending class and never broken. Uh, she can have the Christianese in her mouth, but attitude wise, she will still be very picky very, um, very choosy, you know, and all that. Uh, so yes, practical discipleship is what um, we must seek in a discipler. And we've said that uh, it might be somebody who is a school owner, it might be somebody who is not a school owner, but your bread in life 
uh, has been given, there are tutors and there are governors that God has kept on your path to help you to where you are going. Don't despise them. Don't say, I know it all. Uh, and you know, sometimes God can even be very, uh, let me not use the word ridiculous. He can even bring somebody who um, spiritually has what you need, but physically you are 10 times better than him. <laughs> You, you know, it's like um, you are 60 years old and you are, you go to the hospital and um, the only doctor on duty is this 21 year old doctor. What do you do? Do you say, hey, this small boy, no, 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 no. This, small, this small boy or small girl cannot treat me. Eh? Then go home with your pain. <laughs> So you humble yourself and say, doctor, aha. Then you say, you need to do X, Y, Z, go and run a test, come back. Uh, when you come back, you queue again. You are queuing to see a 21-year-old who is like your, grand, your grandchild. But it's okay. It's okay. Um, you need to, he, at that point, he has your bread. Your health is in his hands. So you must humble yourself. And so sometimes when God sees that you are also very heady, he will give you a disciple that honestly, that's the only person that uh, uh, can help your life. And it will be somebody that is not necessarily uh, educated and sophisticated as you. But in terms of having the bread that your life requires, you can't go without it. And you know, once you even go and say, no, I want to choose my own disciple. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you are with a, another disciple, very big man of God, but he doesn't have time for you. You have a disciple that looks so perfect, you know, but you yourself know that what you require in life doesn't have. So we must prayerfully pray and ask the Lord to say, send me my own disciple uh, and lead me to that person who uh, you have prepared for me, who will help me to the next level, who I can practically see Christ in his life. I can see Christ in his home. I can see Christ in what he does. And um, whatever it is, we can always apply it even into our homes and our businesses. The Lord bless you in Jesus' name. So we'll stop here uh, and then um, pray so that um, we can now round up for today. Yes, go ahead. Ma. Um, let's bring our hearts together to talk to the Lord. We have heard about what discipleship is. It's God's family training scheme. Let's beg the Lord first and foremost. Lord, don't let me rebel against your word. Don't let my heart say, no, that's their own. I have my own way. You know, when God's word is coming, we can deflect it or reflect, refract it. We can make it like, you know, always looking for some, you know, turning it to somebody else. It's coming to us today. Have you understood that this is God's own words to you? Let's first of all talk to the Lord and say, Lord, break my heart. Lord, help me to hear you and to hear you clearly. Don't let me rebel and say, that's their own. I don't need anybody. Once I read my Bible, I'm fine. Tell God that let your word touch me. Help me to understand what you are saying. Help me to believe what your word is saying. As long as it is the word of God, Help me to see it. Help me to do what you are saying. Help me to put myself under that I will come to you and ask you for help to show me your disciple. Let's beg the Lord God Almighty. Well, he said, today we learn that discipleship puts constraints over our lives, but many of us don't want constraints. It puts constraints over our lives so that we will not misbehave. But many of us do not want those constraints. We're constantly fighting and rebelling against constraints. 
Let's beg the Lord and say, Lord, don't let, let me rebel against your constraints. For some of us, our constraints are our husbands, our constraints are, because those are our first disciples, our constraints may be our wives. Let's beg the Lord and say, don't let me rebel against any constraint you have put over my life. Remove the draws from my life. Spiritual discipline means that God is removing the dross. Say, God, disciple me. Remove the dross from my life. Anyone you need to use, I submit. I submit to you first and foremost, and I submit to that person. I submit to that person because I'm first submitting to you. For all the women on this platform, let's beg the Lord. Our husbands are our very first disciples. Let's say, Lord, help me to submit to my husband. Help me to yield to him. Help me to understand that you have put him in my life. And for those of us that don't have disciples yet, let's begin to beg the Lord. Open the eyes of my understanding. Lord, the Bible says that those that seek, find. Help me to truly seek your face concerning a disciple. Don't let me just be plodding through life, hearing from this person, hearing from that person, hearing from every Tom, Dick, and Harry. Give me a disciple that you have put my bread in his hand so that I can grow. I no longer want to be growing small, small, Lord. Father, I need to grow. I don't want, I don't want, I don't want to be left behind because the times are truly perilous. These are the end times. Lord, I need to grow. Give me a disciple that will help me grow. Lord, don't let me dodge your training. The things that you have been sending to my life, don't let me dodge it. Help me, my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. I want us also to go to the Lord now and say, Lord, I can only be an heir if I'm in your family. If I'm not in your family, I cannot hope to inherit you. And only those that you love, the Bible says that you chastise those that you love. We are begging you, Lord. Don't let me dodge discipleship. Don't let me dodge training. We have been told that our attitude to suffering determines our, spirit, our growth in Christianity. Lord, let my attitude to suffering be to embrace it. That's what the Bible tells me. I shouldn't be dodging suffering. I shouldn't be looking for, constantly looking for green pastures. Because sometimes, in where there is no water, where there is no, where there is no, where there is lack is where God needs to train me. Lord, don't let me dodge your, your, your family training scheme. Don't let me dodge any hardship you are bringing into my life, Lord. I'm begging you. Help me. I need someone who has spiritual oversight on me. Don't let me have absolute power for my, on my life. Because absolute power corrupts absolutely. It's a famous term that we all know. Don't let me be corrupt. Help me to be able to find somebody that I can yield to. Somebody that will say, Kai, and I will not do it again. Oh, Lord, help me. We are begging you. Help me to yield to everybody that you have sent to help me. Lord, help me. Help me. Help me to obey you immediately. Another thing we were taught is that discipleship, from it requires for me to obey immediately or at once. We remember how those disciples immediately got up and followed. We are saying, Lord, help me to follow you. As you are speaking to me, as you are speaking to me through the people you will send to me, help me to leave everything and follow you. We are begging you. I need to quicken my growth. Speak to the Lord. Discipleship makes our journey very smooth. There's no need to reinvent the wheel. There's no need to fall where somebody else has, faulted, has fallen. Why not just learn from that person and go? It makes your journey very smooth. Lord, help me to settle down for discipleship. Because this, my school, must bring children to you. This, my school, must bring the parents to you. It must change my community. The, the, the times of these days are so hard. If there are so many deaths all over the place. In as much as we don't, we're not saying be afraid of death. We know that the end times are here. Let's beg the Lord. This is my school. Help me to grow so that my school will be a school that people can see and they can, use, and they can follow you through it. Every child you have brought into my school, Lord, will know you. Everyone you have brought to me, Lord, will know you because of my life. Help me to settle down into this discipleship. Help me, Father. In Jesus' name, we pray. In Jesus' name, we pray. Our Lord and our Savior, we thank you for your teaching this evening. We thank you for coming to us in a strong way. 
Lord, many of us have heard about finding human disciples, but we have just discarded it to the side. We have said, eh, I don't, I don't, I haven't seen somebody that I can, eh, I don't know the person that I, I need. I don't, we have, we have many excuses. Lord, we beg of you today that you will open the eyes of our understanding. If we're not even asking, how will we receive? Help us to ask for those that you have put aside to help us. Lord, we are begging of you that our growth will be speedy because of the work you want to use us for. That, Lord, our schools will be dedicated to you. Help us in this area of discipleship to submit to your family training scheme so that we will be what you want us to be. We thank you for this afternoon, for this evening, for this word this evening. We're asking that as we go, Lord, you will let it reverberate in our hearts. You will expand it. You will use it for your good, that our hearts will yield to you, my Lord and my Savior, that from here on in, we will listen to you and we will listen to those that you have sent us to. Lord, raise disciples for us. And each and every one of us, Lord, make us disciples that we will begin to raise others for Christ. Lord, we cannot give out what we don't have. Help us to be disciples so that we can raise disciples for you. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness towards us. These, these are many other things, Lord, we ask. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen.